Um, Claudia, in the last few months, there's been a lot of international attention focused on what are perceived to be possible changes in the Brazilian forest code or how it's applied. Could you, in general terms, tell us what the issues are and what you see as the process that's unfolding in Brazil? Sure. Um, you know, let me start by saying I think it's really interesting when sort of at certain moments in time the international community starts sort of um, paying attention to the forest code because in Brazil at least it's been under heavy debate for the last 15 years non-stop um, and so a little bit of the history there is that the forest ca code came into being already in the 1930s and I think is one of the most progressive pieces of land use legislation in the world. It's the only country that puts any kind of requirement on private land owners to keep a portion of their land in a, in a private forest reserve. So there are essentially two components. One are these sort of permanent protection areas which typically are on mountaintops or slopes or especially around riparian zones. And then there's this legal reserve as it's called which the size of that legal reserves in terms of the percent of the individual property depends on what biome in Brazil it's located in as defined by Institute of Geography and Statistics. And so debate over the last, well, 15 and then before that even um, years has been changing the percentage, especially in the Amazon forest biome, or and then even in the legal Amazon for even savanna areas. So in the the Amazon forest biome in 1996, they changed the percentage that was required from 50% of the land holding to 80%. And in part, that was in response to a huge spike in deforestation numbers, the highest numbers before to, until 2004 that occurred in 1995. And at that point, I think the government was under severe pressure internationally to do something about deforestation rates and the PPG7 project was developed at that time and a number of other initiatives and one of the things that came out of that was this change in the forest code and it you know the first five years of its life this new change it never actually became law it was an executive order that continually was renewed every 30 days or so for this period of four to five years and so landowners themselves never really saw it as something that they should necessarily follow. I mean, there was a lot of uncertainty because there was always this possibility that it might be overturned, that it might not actually become law. Um, although I think m many of the environmental groups really considered it to be, well, this, this was the law and this is the way it should be done. One big problem from the standpoint of the, the landowners has been they, there was no grandfather clause in the sense that if you were at least legal, let's say in 1995, you still had 50% or more of your legal reserve, you didn't then sort of get to continue to be counted as a legal landholder if you actually had less than 80% as of uh, the, si the time that that executive order was signed in 1996. So in some research I've done in, in one of the highest soy pr producing regions in, in the Amazon, 20%, 25% of landowners became criminals overnight, you know, in, when this executive order was signed. And if you, if you think about that, I mean, these people who really see themselves as, in many cases, you know, law-abiding citizens who are, are really trying to sort of help Brazil become this big economic power. They see themselves as part of the big engine of economic growth in Brazil. And then they're told, no, no, sorry, you're criminals. And on top of that, they're also told, well, you can only use 20% of your land. And I think very often, again, to come back to the international attention, you know, I think when I first heard about the policy, I think when a lot of other people first hear about it, they say, wow, that is so incredible, 80% of land you know, being protected on private lands. Well, if you try to do that in Europe or in, in the United States or in Canada or Australia, I can't imagine what kind of you know, firestorm you would have on your hands um, from ranchers and farmers who simply wouldn't stand for that, especially without any kind of compensation. And, and that's really been the situation. And so. In some senses, I'm not just trying to defend landowners here because certainly there does need to be regulation. And I mean, there are many aspects of this law that really are great and very innovative. But I think that it's important to see why there has been so much debate. Anyway, so recently, I think there's been you know, a lot of strength gathering behind landowner 
lobbyist proposals to make major changes in the forest code and not just reducing the percent of the legal reserve but you know all kinds of issues about legalizing what is currently considered to be you know land that's not being legally managed and that's where a lot of the concern comes from and I think internationally there's probably a lot of concern because it sounds like it's going to lead to more deforestation. That may or may not be the case. I tend to think that it's less likely to lead to more deforestation than it is to simply legalize what has already been cleared and make it and then not require those lands to be restored. And that for me I think is one of one of the big issues. And so we have been working a lot on trying to figure out what kind of mechanisms could you use to, to try to restore some lands, make it less onerous both in terms of labor and, and costs for landowners, which is not something that was ever included in, in these original changes. And do you see red as playing a role in that, in some of these changes that you think might actually be necessary or helpful in this process? I mean definitely I think if if some of this financing could come in the changes that landowners need to to implement on their lands have everything to do with red and have everything to do with needing some kind of funding source in order to whether it's you know growing seedlings in a nursery and out planting them and then monitoring them because they have to restore riparian land or or this legal reserve or if it's just saying hey you know we know you have a high opportunity cost in this region this is a really productive region for soy the cost of land there or the value of land is about a two thousand dollar per hectare versus five hundred dollars per hectare for forest land so for them you know there's a huge opportunity cost I think it could really help to offset it you know one thing that's of course difficult is red or, or whatever it turns out to be is taking a long time to get anywhere where it could actually move some of those benefits um, to these land users you know and, and so I, th I think that's across the board um, not just in Brazil and certainly not just with landholders and I think it's one of the major issues um, that governments um, and subnational governments are trying to deal with is how to actually develop mechanisms for benefit sharing and then also where to get that funding in. I think what Brazil has done at least in my view probably better than, than many other nations is really try to think about land use planning and the forest code is a part of that and then there's these you know legally required zoning plans that each state in the Amazon has to develop and I think those are a really important model for thinking about how red or low carbon development plans really get implemented and I think that's something that especially on the scale that Am that Brazil is working and you know it's not a Costa Rica and Costa Rica has done many wonderful things but you know we're talking about a country the size of well almost the entire United States and and that they're really trying to develop these these zoning plans and strategies and the forest code sort of comes into that I think it's very instructive just in terms of the kind of debate and where the pushback has been you know how do you make it economically viable for people to, to carry out these these agricultural activities whatever they are at the same time that you try to preserve hydrological and climate function in the region and and you know that's I think the thing that for me we really need to focus on is is getting that balance so in that sense I'm I'm not at all advocating that the, the forest code you know be overturned or anything like that but I do think that you know there needs to be sort of a very constructive debate about how to make sure that this climate doesn't um, get completely altered. You gave us a really profound sort of idea of the, the depth, the historical context and all of the forest code and you've mentioned in a few cases a bit about why Brazil may be different, may be somewhat exceptional, partly scale but other issues as well. So do you think there are any broad lessons that other areas, perhaps other large tropical countries, might take from this particular experience of the forest code and the flexibility or non-flexibility that might be involved? I would like to say that, you know, yes, the forest code is working and therefore it's a wonderful example for other countries that also have these large private land holdings or concessions, let's say, with, with large commodity production. Unfortunately, I, I don't think that we can say that it's entirely 
you know, working the way it ought to. And so I think maybe some, m one of the bigger lessons is m thinking about when is the window of our opportunity for, for implementing it and, and how extreme can you be? And, and I think, you know, we often characterize in our discussions in our group forest code as being a little bit the, the perfect being the enemy of the good in the sense that but I think that 80% maybe went a little bit too far. And, you know, there are certainly sectors of the, the environmental movement that would disagree with that. But I, I think that many landowners have been amenable to a 50% legal reserve and sort of felt like that was something that they could live with, that it was still economically viable to, to do their work. And so I think if you, you try to think about what this means for other regions, it's a question of really trying to get the analyses right and the, the get all those perspectives in there, um, that it's not just about preserving forests, but you are already dealing with landscapes that are occupied by people. And I think that's the case for many countries. We're not talking about vast areas that are uninhabited and that aren't being used by people, but in fact they are areas that are being used, whether it's at a small scale because they're smallholder populations or if they're indigenous populations who are using it, or if there are these large companies or, or individuals who are doing commodity farming or, or ranching. To, to really consider the perspectives of all those stakeholders and what, what their cost-benefit analysis is as they make their land use choices. Um, the one problem with the Forest Code has been that it's a, a real command and control policy. It's extremely dependent on an enforcement mm -hmm. component. And that, th there's just not the capacity for that. Brazil has extremely high social capital, um, very talented people, and still they don't have the financial and the human resources to really go out there and apply fines to, to every landholder who has cut illegally or cut in excess of, of what he's allowed to. The judicial system isn't always capable or willing in some cases to process those cases. And for a lot of the landowners, they really consider the, the, the cost or the, the amount of the fine is a cost of doing business. So for them, the amount of profit that they can pull off the land if they clear more than they're allowed to is still much more than the, the amount of the fine, even if they're willing to pay that fine. And many of them aren't because they feel like, you know, the whole, the whole law doesn't make sense or maybe it won't hold and so I'm not going to do this now if in two months from now the law is going to change and I will then be legal again. I think one thing that, that maybe I haven't talked about and I think that's important to consider is that you have this great diversity in size of land holdings in Brazil. So this 80 percent um, until this new change takes place applies to all land holdings whether they are the hundred hectare average smallholder settlement lot that's distributed by the government or it's these you know 82,000 100,000 hectare mega ranches you know, that are especially located in Mato Grosso state, um, where most of the soy production takes place. And these are, you know, these are sort of, you go to the Midwestern Corn Belt in the United States, and, and um, these ranches will put those to shame. You know, there, if you say we've got 50% of that land holding has forest, that's 40,000 hectares of forest. That's not something to sneeze at. That's not something where you should say, you know, that, that they're not protecting forest.